We come today to celebrate Easter. But for some, there's confusion what Easter is about. If you're new to church, you may wonder, what is Easter about? A survey of 1,000 British readers showed that only 48% people knew that Easter was connected with the resurrection of Christ. American religious pollster George Barna found that only 42% of Americans said the meaning of Easter is the resurrection of Jesus. He said 13% were unsure how to describe Easter. 8% said the holiday means nothing to them. 4% said it's a time for getting together with friends and family. 3% said it's a celebration of spring. 2% said it's a time to die and hide eggs. And 1% said it's about the Easter bunny. So I'd like to make as clear as possible today what Easter is about by sharing a story from Luke 15. One day Jesus was teaching in a large city and there were two groups of people with him. On one side were sinners. On the other side were religious, righteous types of people. Uh, The first group were people of the street, irreligious people. Morally bankrupt, uh, spiritually confused, ones who didn't know much about God. The other was a group of religious people who were complaining that Jesus was relating to these people. How dare Jesus reach out to these undesirables? It's really easy for us to make armchair assessments as to who God cares about. If I were to take a poll, and ask what kind of people God really loves, and my guess is there'd be general agreement in the room. Uh, if I asked how many people love, how many people think God loves Pope Francis or Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Community Church in Southern California, has a huge outreach, or Joel Osteen, pastor of the largest church in the United States in Houston, or Andy Stanley, pastor of the second largest church in the United States, you'd say, sure, God cares about them. However, if I were to ask about Ali Khamenei, the leader of Iran, Vladimir Putin of Russia, Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, or President Kim Jong-un of North Korea, some would question if God has much use for them. We all carry around unpublished lists of people we think God can't possibly care about, child pornographers, Drug peddlers, cartels, terrorists, serial killers, rapists. Depending on your political persuasion, you might think God has little use for Republicans. Or God has little use for Democrats. If you're a duck fan, you might think God doesn't care much about beavers. Or if you're a beaver fan, you might think He doesn't care much about the ducks. Although you may not verbalize it, You think, God has no use for people like these, and neither do I. From Jesus' perspective, there should be no division. All of us are brothers and sisters, and all of us are sinners. One group commit what we call detestable sins. The other group commit what we know as respectable sins. Jesus knew exactly what the religious were thinking, so he moved the crowd over by the religious people and began to tell a story. A man had a hundred sheep, and at night he gathered them together, and one was missing. And so he left the ninety-nine under the care of another shepherd and went to look for the one. He found the one on the edge of a ravine, stuck in a briar bush. Rejoicing, he led it home. People were listening still, so he told a second story. A woman had ten coins. She lost one, and she swept her entire house. And when she found it, she called her friend. She was so excited. People were still listening. So Jesus told a story about a man who had two sons. The younger brother got stars in his eyes and wanted to experience some fast lane living. So he asked for his inheritance early. 
His father was still alive, so it was a brazen request. It would be like your son coming to you and say, Hey, Dad, you're going to die someday. You'll probably leave me something, right? Why don't you give it to me now? It was an unbelievable request. But even more unbelievable, the father granted his request. Sure enough, after turning the property into cash, the young man packed his bags and took off for some fast living. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He had lots of fun and friends for a while, but once he squandered his inheritance, he found that fast lane friends don't stick around when the money's gone. Jesus tells us the boy took a job as a mystheos. It's the Greek word for the lowest rung on the ladder of worker. He took a job feeding pigs. For a Jew, there could be no worse job than slopping pigs, animals that were unclean, according to the law. He was so hungry, he was willing to eat the carob pods that the beast refused to eat. In the younger son's rebellion, we see a lot of ourselves. Our Heavenly Father has given us an inheritance. Good minds, healthy bodies, a wonderful world. But He gives it to us on one condition, that we recognize that He is the giver and thank Him. But for many of us, we want to take what He offers without thanking Him. Then the son came to his senses. He realized, my father's servants are better off than I am. I'll go back, ask forgiveness, and work for my dad. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son's lost dignity, he put, gave him the best robe, his own. For the hand that squandered the inheritance, He gives a signet ring to signify that he's restored to his position in the family. The father says, I'm not going to wait until you've paid off your debt. I'm not going to wait until you've duly groveled. You're not going to earn your way back into the family. I'm simply going to take you back. As he came up the road to his father's house, his father came running down the hill to greet him. He didn't wait for his son on the porch, tapping his foot, said, there's that son of mine. There, after all he's done, there better be some serious groveling. No, the father couldn't wait to run down the hill to welcome his son home. The son said, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. The father says, shh, don't talk that way. The father pounces on his son in love, before his father, before the son can even give evidence of his changed heart or even give his repentance speech. Jesus told three parables in rapid fire. Why? I believe he was so tired of the religious people's bigotry that he said, let's clear this matter up. You matter to God. All three stories have a common thread. In each case, something of value is missing. When Jesus finished his stories, I think a light went off in each of the listeners' minds. Say, wow, I matter to God. Everybody here matters to God. Here we are looking down our noses at these people we think God has no use for. Not realizing that God loves every one of us. God cares about people that are living in the fast lane, people that are wielding power, people that are off the track. 
Here's Jesus' whole point. You matter to God. Whether you're a grade schooler, teenager, young single, young married, divorced, widowed, a parent, an empty nester. Easter tells you that you matter so much to God that He sent His Son to die on the cross for your sins. Then He raised Him again to life, to life eternal, so that you could know with certainty that Jesus is God's Son. Once we get the big idea that you matter to God, I think there are at least two things that Jesus wants us to get out of these parables. First, God loves you so much that He makes an all-out search for you. The shepherd searched for the sheep. The woman searched for the coin. And the father searched for his son. The father ran to his son. Whatever else you believe about God, don't miss this. The Father runs to you. Right now, God is running to you to enfold you in his loving embrace. He longs to forgive you and give you new life. Jesus is saying, you want to know what God is like? Look at the Father in this parable. A number of years ago, on a hot day in South Florida, a little boy uh, s- stripped down his clothes and ran across the lawn and dove into the canal behind their house. The mother watched through the kitchen window, and to her horror, she saw as he was swimming out, an alligator was swimming from the other side toward her son. She screamed out the door, turn around! And the boy heard her, and he just did a U-turn and started swimming back to the dock. And she ran out of the kitchen to the dock, but she was too late. As she grabbed his arms, the alligator grabbed his legs. And a huge tug-of-war began. The alligator was much stronger than her. But she was passionate about her son and dug into his arms. A man driving by in a truck heard the scream, and he could see what was happening. And he got out his rifle, and he shot the alligator. Amazingly, the boy recovered, and a journalist came into the hospital to interview him, and he said, can I see the scars on your legs? And he showed him, and the boy, with obvious pride, said, you want to see the scars on my arms? (laughs) His mother's fingernails had dug into him and scraped him. Like that little boy, we have scars. Scars from our past. Like that little boy, we don't realize that we can dive into waters and not be aware that the enemy is lurking. And we have scars because God would not let go of us. He loves us so much. You matter to God like the boy to the mother. And like the son to the father in the parable. God is searching for you. Have you let yourself be found? You've played the game hide and seek. We played it a lot with our family when I was a boy. And Jory and I have played it with our family. The object of the game is to hide and look for an opportunity to run in to declare yourself free. The object is not to hide so well that nobody can find you. When we played it with our youngest daughter, Erica, she would hide behind a chair where we could see her whole body, but just couldn't see her eyes. And if we took more than 30 seconds finding her, she would start to giggle and say, over here, Daddy. She wanted to be found. You don't want to hide so well that Other people just give up looking for you and take off. You can try to hide from God, resist being found, but why? There's no worse feeling than feeling lost and not found. Maybe you're feeling lost. You feel miles away from God. Don't stay hidden from God. Let yourself be found today. 
If you let yourself be found by God, there will be rejoicing in heaven. You give your heart to Christ today and all of heaven will erupt in joyous celebration. Second, God wants people to matter to you in the same way they matter to Him. Jesus shared this parable not simply so that you would know that you matter to God. He was addressing the religious leaders who objected to Him spending time with social outcasts, prostitutes, and notorious sinners. There was no room in their theology for accepting unreligious people into God's kingdom. Jesus says, shame on you. You should care for people the way my Father in heaven does. This leads us to the second half of the parable. This is what we call a double-edged parable. There are two stories in this parable. The first is about a young son who wants his inheritance early, goes off and squanders it, and then he decides this is stupid, and he says, I'll go back, and he asks forgiveness, and he's forgiven. The second story is about the older brother. The older brother is unhappy that the father accepts back the younger brother. In a double-edged parable, the emphasis is always on the second story. Most readings of this parable focus on the younger brother, the prodigal son. That misses the bigger message of the story. There are two brothers in this story. Jesus shows us there are two ways to be alienated from God. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. That's exactly where we expect him to be. He's responsibility and industriousness personified. Uh, There was work to be done. All the time the younger brother was off squandering the money, he's keeping the farm. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. He was angry about the fanfare about his younger brother. Anybody with children understands the tendency towards sibling rivalry. When our second son was born... It soon became obvious that our oldest son, Tad, was irritated with him. He was irritated that he was taking all the attention. And so we found him dumping toys on his younger brother in his crib and putting his blanket over his head. He was trying to get rid of him. Sibling rivalry, we understand. But to refuse to greet his brother upon his return is taking it too far. So his father went and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the cat and fattened calf for him. He says, you've never even given me a goat for a party. How dare you give him the calf? I've worked myself to death and earned everything I have. And yet you lavish wealth on this worthless brother of mine. Where's the justice in that? The elder older brother refers to his record. I have never disobeyed you. So I have rights. I deserve to be consulted. You have no rights to make decisions like these without talking to me. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus points this parable at the religious types who begrudged him extending the kingdom to people with whom they couldn't think to associate. Jesus asked the same question of you. Why can't you forgive people and welcome them into the church the way my father does? Imagine what might have happened if 
The younger brother had met his older brother on the way back before he received the embrace of his father. He would have never made it home. Many people return to church and they don't find it home because they meet older brother types. If being at home with the Father means constantly contending with the self-righteous judgment and indignant attitudes and words from elder brothers, many people would say, no thanks, I'll stay away. Rather than being places of welcome, churches can be centers of judgment. How easy it is for us to make rash judgments about who God cares about. That some people don't matter to God, but the truth is, everybody matters to God. Jesus shows us in this parable that uh, there are two ways to be alienated from God. The younger son wanted the father's money, but not the father. The older son wanted the father's money, but not the father. The younger son was alienated from the father by being very, very bad. The older son was alienated from the father by being very, very good. Jesus wants us to see that the older brother was also alienated from God. He was angry and wouldn't go into the party. He felt he had a right to tell the father how the robes, rings, and livestock should be deployed. In the same way, religious people who live good lives, they think as a result God owes them. The first sign that you have an elder brother spirit is when your life doesn't go the way you want, you aren't just sorrowful, but you're deeply angry. You believe that if you live a good life, you should get a good life. If this is your thinking, you'll be furious when God doesn't give you the things that you think you deserve, after how hard you've worked to be a decent person. If, like the elder brother, you believe that God should bless you because you've worked so hard to be good, then Jesus may be your helper, but He's not your Savior. You're your own Savior. If you're a regular churchgoer, these parables tell you That people are to matter to you like they matter to God. You are to be the visible expression of God's non-judgmental, forgiving, accepting attitude toward people. The elder brothers will look in the mirror for some of us. We wonder if a rascal like the prodigal can slip back into equal status with us, why work to do what's right? If a person can live it up and then experience a deathbed conversion, why spend your whole life trying to be good? Sometimes we resent new people who come into the church. Who are we to stand in the way of God welcoming His children? Maybe you feel convicted, as do I, that you tend to make snap judgments toward people and are not welcoming to everyone. My point is not to make you feel guilty. The good news of Easter is that Jesus was raised from the dead eternally. His tomb was empty, and he was seen by over 500 different people on various occasions. If you give your life to Christ, you serve a living Christ. You have his resurrection power available to you to live inside of you, to make you a loving non-judgmental, welcoming person. The Apostle Paul writes, I pray that you may know His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead. God says, I don't slight you when I forgive people and bring them into the church. You should rejoice when people are found. Jesus leads us to an abiding principle. You matter to God, so people are to matter to you. Jesus calls you to be like your Father in heaven. There are people all around you who need forgiveness. Many of them will not set foot in the church because they feel unaccepted. You must share with them that God forgives them, and you too welcome them with open arms. 
If you're not in the habit of attending church, this text tells you, you matter to God. You may feel God can't possibly care about you, but it's not true. You matter to God. And if you call out today, He will come. In his book, Released from Phoniness, Arnold Prater, a minister, tells this story. A man I knew who stood behind the second chair in the barber shop was a vile man. Now, the owner of this shop, where I was a customer, was a friend of mine, but the other barber, a man of about 65 years of age, was the most vulgar, profane, wicked-talking man I'd ever known. He must have had a fixation about preachers, for every time I came, he seemed to double his output. One day I entered the shop and he was gone. I asked the owner where he was. He said, oh, he's been desperately ill and for a while they despaired of his life. About six weeks later, I came by the shop and saw the man. He was seated in a car where he could see people. He was the mere shadow of a man. His face was the color of death itself. He called to me, crooking a bony finger. When I walked over, he whispered so low I had to stoop to hear him. He said, preacher. I want to tell you something. I was in a coma in the hospital, and I couldn't see or move. They didn't know it, but I could still hear. I heard the doctor tell my wife, I don't think he can last another hour. Preacher, I ain't prayed my entire life, but I prayed then. I said, oh God, if there is a God, I need you now. And when I said that, I don't know how to put it into words, but he was there. He came. Tears welled up in his reddened eyes, and he said, Oh, preacher, just imagine, I kicked him in the face for 60 years, and the first time I called, he came. I tell you that no matter what you've done, no matter how long you've been away from God, you matter to God. If you call on him this morning, he'll come. Let's pray together. I'm going to lead you in prayer. And if my words speak for you, I just ask you to silently repeat after me, whether you're here in the building or you're watching online. If you'd like to commit your life to Christ, just pray this prayer with me. If you feel like you've done that before, but maybe you've drifted from God, you pray this same prayer and recommit your life to Him. Even if you're a longtime follower of Christ, there's absolutely no harm in your repeating after me. Dear God, thank you for creating this world. God, we've messed up this world, and I know I've done my part. I've sinned against you. I am so sorry. I ask you to forgive me. And I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I ask you for him to come into my life today. I want his resurrection power inside me to forgive me and to help me become a non judgmental, forgiving person like you are. And I promise I will do everything I can for the rest of my life to follow him. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching us online and you committed your life to Christ today, would you be so kind as to go to the communication card? It's on the link we sent you, inviting you to attend. And you who are with us in person, if you committed your life to Christ, uh, I'd like you to do the same thing, along with the people online. Uh, there are three options on the communication card. One is, I committed my life to Christ today for the first time. Check that. The second is that I recommitted my life to Christ today after I feel like I've been away from Him. The third option is, I'm curious and I'd like to learn more about Christ. You check whichever one uh, feels right for you. And of course, uh, if we're going to reach out to you and share with you any next steps you can take to grow, we're going to need your name, your email, your address or your cell phone number so we have a way of contacting you.